Okay, great. Well, yeah, well, thanks so much for inviting me and having me uh, at this event. And uh, I was out at Lenox Hill oh, probably six six months ago uh, and meeting with folks. And and uh, I don't know if anyone was there, but I'm, I'm glad to hear you guys have the this brain interns uh, or brain turns program. And uh, again, glad to to share a little bit about what we've been doing. So I'm at the Feinstein Institute, and my name is Chad Bowton, and I. Uh, I'm a professor here, but also direct a lab called the Neural Bypass and Brain Computer Interface Lab. And, uh, and we're part of the Institute for Bioelectronic Medicine. And uh, the Feinstein Institutes, if you don't already know, is kind of the research arm for Northwell Health. Uh, I came to Northwell Health about five years ago. I spent uh, 20 years prior to that uh, doing uh, leading kind of a neurotechnology group at, a, uh, at an institute called Battelle. Uh, it's a large uh, research and development institute, and uh, I've been in the medical uh, technology world for, I guess, about 25 years now. Uh, so, uh, you know, don't hesitate to stop me with, with questions if you're able to do that. I, I don't know if I'll see any raised hands, or maybe, Josh, you can flag me or text me if somebody wants to ask a question, uh, and I'll if just kind of get started here. If you want, at the top of your screen, you should be able to pull up the chat and it will put it it'd be in the corner of your screen, but they won't see it. Yeah. Let me see. Yeah, let me see if I can. Okay, I got it. Yep. Yep. And we just see your PowerPoint, so you're all good. Okay, great. Okay, so so what we've been doing uh, that I think is is perfect, I think, for your, your backgrounds is we've been restoring uh, or attempting to restore movement and the sense of touch in folks that are living with paralysis. And we do this with, uh, through a couple different ways or methods we've developed. And one of them is called the bidirectional neural bypass. So we do recording in the brain, the motor cortex, and we also stimulate uh, in, this, in the primary uh, somatosensory area. And I'll, I'll get into that and kind of talk about how we image, how we map, uh, how we stimulate, and how we not only record, but how we process these signals. And we can literally decipher uh, individ an individual's thoughts uh, as they think about movement, even if they've been paralyzed for many years. Uh, so we've learned a lot. It's been fascinating. Uh, and I'll share some of our stories. Okay, I'm going to try to... Okay, now it should be advanced. Okay, so these are some of the patients that I had the pleasure, uh, absolute pleasure of working with. And on the left is a, a young man named Matthew Nagel. Um, he was stabbed in the spinal cord, actually, uh, when he was out uh, with some friends and um, obviously he ended up in, a, in an altercation and um, at this point he became a tetraplegic and he uh, had really no use of his hands, uh, his arms, it was uh, a struggle, uh, it was fairly high up, about a C4 level injury. Um, and he became the very first uh, participant to enroll in the study we were doing at that time. Uh, this is about 15 years ago or almost 15 years ago. And the study was about putting in a single electrode array in the motor cortex, so an M1. And the big question at that time was, uh, would someone years after injury uh, still have uh, relevant signals in that area? Uh, would the motor cortex uh, remap uh, to the point where we, we wouldn't be able to do anything useful uh, or record you know, viable signals? Uh, and it turned out that um, we found no evidence of remapping and that the signals uh, were modulating and looked you know, very uh, intact um, even years after his injury when he enrolled into the study. And then uh, in the middle is a young man who had ALS. And so he's paralyzed, he was paralyzed obviously uh, as well, but for a completely different reason. And the challenge with him was uh, just uh, trying to find out, he was the very first ALS patient that was, was ever enrolled in this kind of study. Uh, but to find out if the, um, if the you know, signals would still be uh, functional uh, or viable again in the motor area. Uh, it had progressed pretty far with him. And when I met him, he couldn't make any facial expressions. Uh, he uh, really had a hard time uh, communicating in any form. He could, he could blink at that point, uh, but even that uh, took effort. So uh, ALS is a horrible condition, as you all know. Um, yeah, but he, uh, but he made huge strides and I'll talk a bit about that. And on the right, uh, is Kathy Hutchinson and Kathy, um, Kathy was amazing as well and worked, uh, many, many, uh, months with her. 
uh, she uh, had a stroke, pontine stroke, and was paralyzed, uh, uh, you know, from the about mid chest down, uh, really had very little use of her hands and, and arms and legs. Um, and with Kathy, she couldn't speak either. Uh, so one, so one kind of personal thing I'll, I'll share, um, Dr. Ortiz uh, kind of shared a little bit about his journey uh, and background. And for me, I had, in grad school, I had uh, really focused a lot on signal processing, uh, control theory, and was really headed for a career in advanced uh, robotics and things like that and different technologies uh, in that area. But then biomedical engineering was always of interest and I happened to, a couple years into my career, happened to uh, get involved with, with uh, neurotechnology efforts and involved with this study because they were really struggling with decoding these signals. They, the signals look good, but they didn't know how to decipher them uh, to the level they wanted. So anyway, I became involved, uh, but at the, uh, as I was wrapping up and finishing grad school, I myself had a traumatic uh, brain injury. And like Matthew Nagel, I ended up in the wrong place at the wrong time. And uh, I was thrown to the, to the concrete um, and I uh, had subdural hematoma, you know, except, well, bleeding all, all night. Uh, they had to go in multiple times and stop the bleeding uh, and, and resolve the, uh, uh, the hematoma. And, um, and I was extremely lucky in, in the coming months or the following months uh, in terms of my rehabilitation. And I also couldn't speak in the beginning, um, had intensive speech therapy. Uh, I spent uh, you know, many months uh, dealing with uh, speech and physical therapy and, and a number of things. Um, but I was extremely, extremely lucky and was able to recover, uh, dealt with headaches for, for many years, but, um, uh, but beyond that, um, I was able to uh, you know, really get back uh, into the, to the grind and, um, and I fell in love with this field when this opportunity came along. And ever since then, I've been uh, trying to figure out how to uh, you know, reroute signals in damaged uh, portions of the nervous system. And that's really what all this is about uh, that we're gonna discuss. Okay, so let me move on from there. This is a, a clip. I, you know, I normally, I, I, I probably, how much time do we have, Josh? You got till 12. Till 12, okay, so we have, so we have time. Maybe I'll show this, this is a, uh, and I only show this because we, this was the, was the only footage. In fact, we had, it happened to be that the media caught wind of what we were doing in these first studies, um, 60, minutes uh, had come and brought a crew and they captured the one and only time, uh, the first time that, uh, that Kathy even tried this, uh, where she's controlling a wheelchair um, using the decoding algorithms that, uh, that, that we worked on uh, and drove this wheelchair. I'll, I'll, I'll just show you the clip. Kathy Hutchinson is among the first humans to have her brain directly wired to a computer. We're seeing Kathy moving this cursor with nothing but her mind. That's pretty amazing. And so, I mean, if Kathy can control a cursor, she can control anything a computer is connected to. That's the goal. Well, even a wheelchair at some point. Ready to try it for real? In fact, Kathy has already driven a wheelchair. See if you can drive it right over to the door. They haven't let her ride in it yet for her own safety. <laughs> But with monkeys adopting robot arms and a completely paralyzed person driving a chair, imagine where this could be headed. Fantastic. Very good. So we, uh, so the, uh, if you notice that, um, Kathy, oh, sorry, let me skip to the next. So you, so Kathy was, you know, she was, she was beaming uh, after that and smiling just ear to ear. And we told her you could go over that door and if you run into it, we'll, we'll paint it, we'll take care of it. Uh, and, but she stopped literally two inches from that door and uh, just right on the money. And she literally had just done that for the first time. And so if you remember driving a real, like a remote control car uh, as a kid, you know, you can get turned around. Well, she figured it out. Um, she drove all over the room. And then we, we really kind of realized at that point that while this is something where, uh, and for her, it was seven years after her pontine stroke, but this is something that we can use to really uh, decipher signals in the motor area. They're, they're clear as, uh, you know, they were very clear. It took us some effort to get to extract the right signals and modulate. We, I had her spend a lot of time on 
imagining wrist movements, ulnar and radial deviation, flexion, extension, a lot of these exercises. And she would watch the, the cues on the computer and even we would kind of, you know, coach her on this. Uh, but pretty soon her signal started to, to get better and better. Um, I, we don't have evidence that there was any remapping even seven years later because she could think about very specific arm and hand and wrist movements. And, um, and those were very distinct signals. We, we used different types of pattern recognition uh, and different signal processing techniques, but everything was very distinct. And that happened pretty quickly, um, you know, within the first you know, few sessions. So there's no evidence that she had uh, dramatic, you know, or any kind of you know, high levels of, uh, of uh, you know, plasticity or changes that she had to overcome. That would have probably taken months if that was the case. So, but just within a few sessions, he's doing this. And then we realized, well, why couldn't we re now reroute these signals? Okay, we call this a new uh, unidirectional neural bypass. So a one-way highway here. Why couldn't you take those signals, uh, you know, decode them in the computer, and then recode or re-encode those signals uh, appropriately for muscle stimulation directly? And, you know, it sounds like science fiction, but we thought, well, there's no reason that a person couldn't regain volitional control of their own, uh, you know, movements in their hand. Uh, they're driving their own stimulation. They're in, in essence, um, you know, reconnected electronically. And so we decided, uh, let's give it a shot. Uh, the very first, so it only took about five years to plan and prepare uh, for the study. And, and uh, but the first gentleman that we enrolled as a, a young man, I've gotten to know very, very well now for, for six years. Um, is uh, was Ian Burkhardt and Ian um, really he was 19 when he went to the beach with his family and his friends and these are this is his brother on the left and a friend of his on the right and um, you know they were out just jumping into the waves and diving and whatnot and he dove into a large wave that pushed him into a sandbar head first uh, and he uh, has a C5 level injury partial preservation at C6 uh, but he doesn't uh, you know uh, can't use his hands um, he can, he has bicep, okay, common with C5, he has bicep, but not tricep, can't suspend, support, uh, and again, from mid chest down, uh, you know, non-functional movement, and um, also uh, his sensory, uh, you know, aspects of uh, sense of touch uh, and proprioception are dramatically uh, affected uh, for him, and that's something that I'm going to talk about later in the, in, the, in the presentation, where we're now trying to restore touch as well. We, with paralysis, even the word is all about movement, but, but uh, as you probably know, a high percentage of the cases uh, of these types of injuries and, and in strokes result in sensory deficit. And so uh, we're trying to attack both now. And, and this is really important for Ian and, and some new patients I'll tell you about. But what happened with Ian was, was um, just, uh, we were just uh, surprised uh, because, you know, in the beginning there were challenges. So let me show you this and we certainly, had our fair share of these problems, but let's watch what happens. So I'm skipping over the surgery, the surgery we did fMRI, we mapped that, I'll show you some images in a bit. Uh, but the, about a month later after implanting the, uh, the array in M1, uh, he was able to literally think about uh, opening his hand, which he normally can't do. Uh, we decoded that, we're stimulating through all of these about 150 electrodes um, that are, these are highly flexible electrodes we developed. Uh, we're stimulating his muscles transcutaneously. He could open his hand, no problem. He can even begin to grab that spoon so he could think about different types of flexion. Um, but every time he tried to move that spoon anywhere in space, uh, you know, left, right, up, down, didn't matter, uh, he would drop it. Okay, so what? So I'll throw a question out there and I guess you guys can, can try to think of, of reasons for this and maybe text them in the text box, but why? Why would he drop the spoon every time he tried to move, uh, you know, translate? And that, that's using his shoulder, residual shoulder ability. Um, there's a lot happening in one to give you a little hint. Uh, no sense of weight. Oh, good. Yeah, somebody made a comment. No sense of weight. Uh, that, yeah, he has a lack of proprioception, um, which is tied in, obviously, with muscle tension and, and sense of weight of the object. That's a very good, very good guess. Perception. I see someone, uh, no muscle tone. His muscle was okay for lifting and moving. You know, he could do a pretty good job, but his hand kept opening up. Um, someone says, his fingers in his hand are not all open. Okay, so, right, so when we stimulate 
and someone who's had an injury was four years with Ian after injury when he was implanted. Uh, there is definitely uh, s- some stiffening, uh, some rigidity in the hand. The ligaments uh, prevent a full extension. Uh, so that's a mechanical problem. Um, so a lot, I see a lot of great guesses. Okay, so and some of these guesses are very uh, close to the mark. So what was happening, we had, to, we had to do a series of experiments to determine this, but when he begins to translate, uh, so we did some cute experiments with the timing, uh, and I think I have a plot. Of, yeah, so here's a plot on this. When he starts translating, not only are the neurons that, and remember, we're, we're seeing, you know, maybe 100, at the beginning we were seeing maybe 130 uh, neurons that we were working. That's not very many considering uh, the 87 billion, you know, neurons in the brain and the millions that are in the, you know, millions and millions in the motor cortex um, alone or just in one alone in the hand area. So what, what happens is when he moves, um, you know, we, we see the opening, the closing, the neurons that modulate related to that. But when he moves, now you have all these other neurons that jump in. We had only trained the decoding algorithms on the opening and closing and that kind of neural network, if you will, or that network of, of uh, neurons and the signals. When he translates, we saw this whole other group of neurons that would modulate, mostly related, we suspect, to the, to the shoulder and I think later we confirmed that, but the shoulder, uh, we obviously you have, uh, you have directionally tuned neurons in the brain. So just thinking about left, right, up, down, you know, even in and out, you know, your th- uh, three dimensions, that uh, those neurons get excited. Um, when you just watch somebody move, it's how we learn uh, when we're young and even when we're older. Uh, and there's a lot of debate, uh, you know, around mirror neurons, but we certainly saw evidence of that. Um, and so there was dramatic changes. You can kind of see that in the timing here. So, so stimulation starts, he grabs it, and then transfer cue. That's when he starts to move, and then wham, all of a sudden you see these additional red, and that, that red indicates uh, high activity and modulation of those other neurons. So, so that, we had to go back to the drawing board. And so what we did is we decided, let's, let's train these decoding algorithms, these pattern recognition methods, uh, on a lot more data that's static and dynamic and let them move different different ways and, and blend, we called it mix uh, blending. So we blended that information uh, together and we trained uh, more robust algorithms. Uh, and pretty soon he was able to grasp and move and maintain uh, that grip. Uh, this led to uh, some later publications. Uh, we had a really um, kind of a a real, a real uh, uh, impactful paper we were thankful for uh, when this all came together. And this shows not only his wrist modulation, I think, hopefully you can see my, my mouse, but I'm just pointing to D, uh, panel D. This is about different types of uh, neurons that modulate for different types of movements. Uh, we've now isolated individual finger movements uh, in Ian and in other patients now, I'll show you. Uh, but you can see that um, uh, really the key is to, to be able to drive uh, something functional. Okay, so let me, let me kind of get to, you know, the, the, you know, kind of the culmination here. What, so if you think about it, you've become paralyzed and you've lost the use of your hands. Uh, what an impact to your life. And just something as simple as picking up a cup, you know. Um, and I asked Ian early on, you know, we were kind of, you know, just trying to get a feel from him. What does he want to be able to do? And he said, I just want to be able to pick something up on my own, you know, pick up a, a, a glass of water. And, and because until then he had to ask for help for everything. And, um, and this is a big, a big deal um, and a big, you know, a big priority is hand function and independence. It's really about independence. And so uh, for someone who uh, is living with tetraplegia, um, this is what it's about. So let me show the video after everything finally was sorted out. Here's what he was be able to do. And no, and no dropping. So he, you know, he was able to do this over and over. Um, and of course it, at some point we joked around, yeah, he probably would have wished there was beer in that, uh, in that mug, but uh, because, <laughs> because, because there was only about, you know, 200 volt, maybe 150 to 200 volts uh, at different times on those electrodes, we decided that's probably not a good idea. We'll keep the liquid out. <laughs> so, and then, and then watch this, watch his fingers very closely and you wouldn't know this is someone uh, who's completely paralyzed. 
he literally uh, learned how to play Guitar Hero, and he could modulate, he could actually move individual fingers. Uh, we learned how to decode that modulation, <laughs> and we were all, well, this is the very first time we, we caught it on, a, on an iPhone, and uh, everybody was, was just, you know, tickled because um, he's, he's sitting there and he's doing riffs and whatnot, and, uh, and, and he could do dynamic movements. So we learned that there's, there's unique patterns for not only static, you know, movements as, as you know, we all know when we read, you know, we learn about this uh, in the motor cortex, but what hasn't been studied um, extensively is, is that switching between static and rhythmic and that transition and what changes uh, in terms of the neural activity. And we found uh, these fascinating changes in terms of the, the ensembles of neurons that they become involved. And sometimes some of the neurons are involved in both the static and the rhythmic, but then there's a whole other group of neurons that, uh, that become involved when you do rhythmic. Okay, so I'll do a little quick test on everybody. So if you drum your fingers, you can just do it right now against your palm or on your table uh, or wherever you are. Just start drumming your fingers really fast with your dominant hand. Okay, go fast, fast, fast. Okay, now stop. Now reverse the direction. Okay, does it feel awkward? Does it, did you slow down? Uh, probably was quite strange. Uh, well, it turns out um, the, it, so normally I have everybody raise their hand, but, but let's, you know, I'm going to guess that about 85%, and this turns out uh, it's exactly the percentage, uh, most of you, you know, do it from pinky to index is your fastest way. But then when you try to reverse it and it's awkward, you know, it's the opposite. Now, 15% of the population actually does it with index to pinky as their fastest, most comfortable way. So it turns out we're hardwired. This has to do with central pattern generators and the spinal cord. Uh, you probably have all learned about this. Uh, there's 10 million neurons just in the spinal cord alone, uh, nothing compared to the brain, but still, when you talk about millions of neurons, that means there's a lot of computation uh, happening in the cord, uh, in the interneuronal networks in the cord. Um, and that is, um, uh, or, you know, the gray matter and so on. And that's, that's um, uh, fascinating, and we've been learning a lot about that. All right, a couple questions popped up. Uh, let me see if I can go back real fast here. Uh, how to see, uh, where are the phases, completion frustration? There's a question about, could this technology be used to augment people with out of medical condition? Yes, so at the end, I'll probably, or you know, we can talk about it now, is that we see uh, a lot of possibilities in the future. And this is where some people think this is incredible and fascinating. So, you know, a few people will say this is scary, you know, we're tapping into the brain. Uh, but we're not only recording, but we're stimulating. I'll show you in a moment. And we're creating sensations. And so we have this, this two-way window into the brain. And so, um, you know, it it's, it's, has huge uh, implications. And uh, we're being approached now by folks that have ALS. Mo last week, uh, another gentleman with uh, uh, unspecified motor neuron disease has, has uh, approached us. There's, um, let's see, so how do the electrodes uh, give him motor neuron control? Okay, so he's not, so he, well, he can think about movements, and we found this in multiple patients now. They can think about the movements. They can, even years after injury, they can evoke uh, that modulation in the motor cortex. The tough part is getting that signal out or, or picking it up before the blockage. So the blockage could be in the brainstem, like Kathy. It could be, uh, it could be uh, lower motor neuron uh, issues. It could be spinal cord injury. Um, it could be stroke. Now, stroke is, you have to be careful that the stroke hasn't devastated the, you know, the primary motor cortex uh, or premotor because those are the two areas we can, we can pick up uh, really good signals. Um, does he get headaches? Uh, he had fatigue. He had mental fatigue in the beginning, the first sessions. It was like, he said it was like taking a long exam or like the, you know, SAT and, uh, but then he got better uh, and just got where it was, he could go three hours in a session, no problem. And now it's like second nature. Uh, where are the electrodes placed? Uh, primary motor cortex, M1. It's 100 electrodes. I normally have one uh, around here somewhere. It's, it's smaller than a P. These are tiny, tiny electrodes, uh, four millimeters by four millimeters, and they're only about a millimeter and a half long. And so we use a little bit of air, and we, and we tap them in with just a puff of air. Uh, and then they seat there at the surface and um, they go into about the uh, fifth layer uh, of the cortex. That's what we want because we have the, uh, you know, pyramidal neurons, you know, good sized neurons there. That's a really good place. Although we've recorded from the surface of the brain too. I'll, I'll talk about in a moment. Okay, so let's skip to uh, the next. Um, 
are there, someone asked, are there side effects? You know, um, no, there's a headache in the very, like first, you know, uh, right after surgery, first couple of days, um, you know, but that's like with any, uh, you know, surgery like this. And then after that, no, there's been no side effects. Ian has now uh, become the longest uh, implanted patient. Uh, we've had six years, in fact, um, he just broke the record uh, and uh, he's doing great. You have to watch out for, you know, just watch the site uh, because you have a connector there, uh, percutaneous. Uh, you have to, um, you know, just kind of keep an eye on that. Um, the um, acceler okay, so now let me let me kind of go into uh, the next segment, and then I'll I'll do another pause for some questions. Uh, the The challenge that we have is how do we accelerate all of this and reach more people? Uh, we had some uh, some stories uh, that came out a few months ago. Uh, There's another kind of set of stories and people are calling in, especially with the COVID situation. Uh, we've had rehab centers that we work with calling us. We've had patients and families calling us because, uh, because we are working on a wireless version of this technology and people wanna know how can we reach people in their homes or can they take some of this home? Well, lo and behold, uh, we are now working on that. In fact, we're working on a, a non-invasive version of the, of the stimulation I'll talk about and also a non-invasive version that can infer uh, certain uh, thought patterns around uh, movement. And so uh, not, you're not gonna play Guitar Hero, uh, but you can uh, perhaps do things like grasping, and I'll show you that, or picking things up, a uh, cup, or feeding yourself. Uh, all very, very important things. Okay, so we had to first figure out how do you make a wearable device for transcutaneous stimulation of the muscles? Okay, this is, this is something where we built something called focal stim. Uh, we, we basically have tailored um, and, and optimized the stimulation parameters and also how we direct the field uh, through these textile uh, electrodes. They're all cloth. And we also have some wearable patches now that are wireless uh, or will soon be wireless in the next uh, month or so. And with this, um, people are opening and closing their hands. They're doing pinch grasp, you know, basic grasping uh, techniques for picking up water bottles and even, uh, you know, small objects. Um, there's left some limitations, but it's uh, still really opening up some doors. Uh, focal stem, as I said, is optimized. Um, we uh, deal with the frequency, the waveform itself. Turns out that some of this can now be used in the brain, which may interest uh, many of you or some of you, uh, because if you tailor these waveforms, you can really affect uh, how much tissue you're stimulating, how focal the field is. Uh, part of my background is in, in uh, electromagnetics, and so we spent a lot of time really figuring out how do you t uh, dial that in? How do you make it focal? Uh, you want to hit small targets, whether it's a nerve or a muscle segment or even uh, a group of neurons in the brain. This is all very, very important. Uh, so we can talk uh, more about that if anyone's interested. Um, but what, let me show you some videos. So what we were able to do is isolate uh, individual finger movements even, even more focally, and we actually have been able to get the middle joints to act to basically bend in the fingers, and that's a balancing act between flexors and extensors. Let me just show these videos. So we can isolate that middle joint, which is pretty, has been very difficult up until now to do, and then this video is showing um, cycling where we can do typing, like stroke, like keystroke type movements in the fingers, which has also been um, extremely useful. So we're not there yet, but we hope to maybe help people type again with this kind of these kinds of techniques. And we do our own custom uh, electronics. Um, why is that? You know, why is that important? Well, wearable technology is exploding right now, and if you can help somebody not only with with severe injuries or traumatic uh, type injuries, you can also help folks that have overcome a stroke. And I know I came in the tail end of the uh, the previous talk, but when we talk about uh, you know, strokes, yes, they come in and, and, and there's often multiple strokes. And my mother-in-law had, had multiple strokes and she lost a, a dexterity in her hand and she never really regained that to the point where she could use that hand for writing. And that was her writing hand, you know, her dominant hand. And, uh, you know, this is a huge problem. Um, we've now looked at the numbers over 100 million people around the world that are living with uh, these kinds of uh, levels of paralysis and about 65, shockingly, 60 to 65 percent um, are dealing with hand issues still, and that's stroke and spinal cord injury. Those are the two leading causes, believe it or not. 
Um, and about 60% of spinal cord injuries uh, involve the hands. Uh, we used to think it was a, uh, a small percentage or a lower percentage or less than half. No, it's, it's actually more than half. And um, so we're working very hard on what's called the NeuroTouch program to bring all of this together uh, to not only make the wearable I'll talk more about, but also to see, can we stimulate, can we now kind of go the other direction? You know, pick up information about uh, sensory uh, events. You know, someone engages a water bottle. Um, I, just, I just engage this bottle, but I'm adjusting my grip very, very precisely because if I squeeze too hard, even just slightly harder, it's going to start to squeeze the water out. Um, if I don't squeeze hard enough, obviously I drop it. Uh, so there's a, turns out there's a very narrow window and tactile feedback is key to that. So we have uh, been pinpointing with uh, uh, fMRI uh, techniques that we've developed. We've been working with uh, Lenox Hill actually, uh, and also working with uh, Mount Sinai. And um, we have uh, been, we've been using the Mylan uh, uh, information. Uh, Matt Glazer uh, is one of our collaborators. Uh, he had a nature paper actually back in 2016 uh, on these techniques of really using the Mylan information. Uh, we've talked, you've heard about the human connectome. Uh, database and, and so basically we lay down these boundaries. We can start to pinpoint where digit one is, you know, so thumb, index, middle finger, uh, the various digits. We're looking at uh, things like proprioception, uh, sensory information in three, you know, B, tactile sensory information um, can be in the sulcus for the fingertips in some people, but we're finding out not always. And uh, we're trying to get um, areas on the gyrus where we can place electrodes. Uh, but we're also doing some fascinating things with stereo electrodes too, and working with um, Ash Meta and uh, uh, various folks at Lenox Hill, um, and uh, we're really starting to get some some great information on this. So these are just more images, kind of showing how we pinpoint the areas. Um, the uh, this is really this has been something where we compared high density ECOG grids um, and. Uh, uh, we also in stereo SEEG, and we found out. Of course, stereo gives you a little more deeper access, and so when you have uh, the stereo electrodes running by the sulcal wall, uh, where you can't put one of these um, Utah rays that I showed in the beginning, they, they like to sit on the gyri, uh, but but the stereo can access that and can run by the sulcal wall. And lo and behold, we've gotten some beautiful responses in terms of thumb uh, uh, percepts here. Now here we're asking them to. To move and and whatnot, but we've now shown that we can touch, uh, like usually with a plastic uh, little monofilament, we touch uh, different parts of the finger, but we now can touch the pads and get very clear signals from the stereo uh, electrodes uh, and some of the uh, ECOG as well. Stereo has some huge advantages. In fact, um, on the right is an MEG uh, type image where uh, that was tricky, but we, this is in a spinal cord injury participant. This is only just from, um, you know, this earlier this year uh, or late last year. And we have been able to uh, isolate wrist, index, thumb, different finger areas. Uh, very difficult to do, but we're using source localization and uh, some additional processing on this to get that kind of resolution. Uh, hopefully we'll have a paper uh, with, uh, this is uh, Santosh. Um, uh, Chandra Shekharan uh, in my lab that's uh, working on this uh, and a number of other people uh, in Ash Meta's lab and Stefan uh, Bickel, uh, Jose Herrero, uh, just a long list of uh, great, great folks working on this and um, it's just been fascinating. Uh, I've been trying to look at decoding signals from stereo from both uh, ECOG on the surface of the brain but stereo electrodes too because stereo Someone had asked about infection earlier. Um, your infection uh, rate goes down for stereo, right? Because you're going through a small hole versus a full craniotomy. And so that's a huge advantage. And it's been used now uh, in epilepsy patients for quite a few years, um, but people are still you know, adopting it. And it's, uh, it's still a growth area. Uh, but what we're finding is that you can not only stimulate and get some fascinating uh, percepts in the fingers, uh, and tactile sensations, um, uh, you can also record from these stereo uh, sites and you can get detailed information about finger movement. I personally was not optimistic that we would be able to decode individual finger uh, information, uh, but lo and behold, I, I had to use some uh, co almost completely different techniques um, and kind of revamping everything. But 
but now uh, we are seeing uh, information and decoding it or separating it for different fingers. Um, really just a huge uh, step forward. Hopefully we'll have another paper uh, coming out in the next few months. Um, let me show this. I want to kind of show you guys everything and then open up to questions. Uh, this is an animation of now the bidirectional neural bypass. So you guys all know about kind of spinal cord injury and the basics. But how do you decode information for the you know, movement? And then at the same time, uh, can you restore touch while someone's actually moving their hand? So the, the two separate pieces have been done. You know, we, we did the first motor work. Um, uh, University of Pittsburgh did some great work for some sensory, but, but no one's pulled it together for the hand, the actual hand. Uh, because when you close that loop, uh, a lot happens. And you'll see here in a second, kind of the, uh, the closing of that loop. Okay, so you'll see there's, we have thin film sensors on the fingers that pick up that tactile information. We feed that back into the computer. Uh, we have to de decipher that, not as much, but we, we process it. And, but then we have to figure out what kind of signals are we going to uh, stimulate S1 with? Okay, so here's S1 back here. It just, it just lit up. How in the world do you know what patterns to use for that? Um, they are complex. Uh, and when you use simple patterns, uh, you, can, you can cause some person, but it doesn't feel natural. So one of the problems we're still working on is how do you encode correctly to actually create natural percepts. Um, and so it's another just fascinating, wonderful problem to work on. And if you're, um, and on any of this, if anybody's interested in any aspects of it and getting involved, just, just, you know, reach out to me. Um, but, but that's an open question. How do we do that? We've got some nice, uh, you know, sensations, but they're, you know, they might feel a little bit electrical or might feel a little, you know, mechanical, but we have shown that you can get different levels. Um, so they can report like a one to five or, you know, zero to 10 kind of rating. And, and there's, there's definitely some correlation uh, with our stim level. Okay, we use little impulses of stimulation and, um, and you can change the rate uh, the, or you can change the amplitude of those stimulation uh, pulses. And that's the key. Okay, let me stop right here for a couple. So why is it called the uh, neuro bypass? Okay, <laughs> so someone's asking yeah, the name. So, so in fact, way back in the 70s, um, someone uh, first had kind of suggested this phrase, uh, the neural, this neural bypass. And I started ca calling it kind of, in, you know, didn't know about that till later, uh, but started calling it an electronic neural bypass. Because obviously we're rerouting signals, we're trying to bypass the injury. Uh, we're recording at one end, we're stimulating at the other. Uh, and, and in fact, it's an artificial uh, bypass, um, but it's a neuro, it's a neural type, a neuro, uh, you know, you call it a neural bridge. Um, you know, uh, you can, uh, but there's a trademark on that. And we, we found that uh, out by getting a, a letter of, uh, they call it a desist, cease and desist letter. So, uh, <laughs> so I wouldn't suggest trying to use that, that phrase, but, um, but the neural bypass is a, is a generic term. Um, and that's why we call it that. Bidirectional then, of course, means how do you take tactile information and uh, send it the other direction uh, back to the brain and stimulate or encode you know, that signal. Uh, so, and then what happens when you, when you do both? The brain is going to now have to uh, embody this, this artificial bypass, right? It's used to working through the spinal cord. And there's a lot of processing in the spinal cord, as I mentioned earlier, both on the motor, you know, the descending signals, also the ascending signals, the afferent. Uh, signals. And so uh, imagine now you've, you've got this new, you know, your hand is moving again and oh my gosh, you're feeling some things. It's kind of artificial. Uh, I mean, it feels artificial, but it's, it's this new, uh, you know, connection that you're learning how to use and this new version of your hand. It's not, we're not to the point where it's fully natural. Uh, a lot of work to, has to be done. Okay. Um, all right. So now, um, now, the glide, the final uh, piece here. Um, we have been working very, very hard on creating a non-invasive version of this technology. We're still working on the invasive because it's, it's, uh, you know, m can do a lot more, um, especially for folks that are, are, you know, really, you know, dealing with a severe injury and, and, and a, a severe level of paralysis. Uh, but we are trying to now figure out, could we help folks that have had a stroke or have had a spinal cord injury and have, you know, they can move their arms, but they can't move their hands. 
Okay, so what do we do um, on this? Uh, we just, uh, we just um, uh, issue our paper is literally just, you know, at the printer, at the printing press uh, right now um, on something we developed called GlidePath. This uh, technology is, is came out of us realizing that when people move, you know, uh, all of us that are able-bodied and folks that are paralyzed all move in a slightly, you know, different way. And we've all kind of, you know, we have our body language, uh, you know, our, our um, kind of reaching that we do. I reach for this water here, uh, or I reach for my pen on my desk, and guess what? Every single trajectory that I made for those, uh, every time I do it, it's a little different, but, but there's unique aspects of it. So how you rotate your forearm, how you move through space uh, is something you can learn. And, and it, it dawned on us as we were watching, I was with a patient a couple years ago and we were just kind of see, noticing that he leans over and he, you know, he has to kind of move his shoulder in a certain way because it's not, he doesn't have full strength. And we got the thought, you know, well, why don't we put sensors on on his arm and can capture that trajectory information and, and that rotation and everything that's done. And lo and behold, we can use deep learning, uh, the way we're now, we're now using deep learning in the brain too, but we can use deep learning to collect uh, you know, data on this and learn those patterns. And so when I reach for my water bottle, um, there's a certain way I do it. Most of the time we reach and it turns out in like a C, kind of a C pattern in the horizontal plane because we wanna set our hand up to open and grasp with you know, what we call cylindrical grasp. If I reach my pin though, I, I do it in a kind of an arc. So I'm gonna reach over the top of it. It's very subtle, but I reach over the top of it. So I set myself up for a pinch grasp and I pick my pin up. Okay, so those are very distinct and in different planes. And we've now been able to decode those at like a 99% um, accuracy rate. Uh, let me just show you. So we have a wireless patch. Uh, you can put this on uh, you know, someone who's had a stroke or a spinal cord injury. Uh, they love wearables because with no wires because um, they need to be able to put it on you know pretty quickly they have their routines um, it can't be overly complicated so they put this on uh, and we now have had a young man I'm going to show you this video uh, his name is Casey he's been in our lab for this past year uh, and watch what he was able to do and he does not have a brain implant so he just simply reaches it stimulates the appropriate muscles to open his hand. He also has some rigidity in his fingers, but he got a good, good opening. He then uh, was able to grasp and get the flexors all uh, stimulated. And of course he could eat that candy bar, do whatever he wanted. When he was ready to release it, he just reaches again. Um, and you can also do arbitrary uh, motions. His favorite number, I see, I'm trying to remember, I think Casey likes uh, uh, three, or he also likes seven, I remember. And so you can, you remember you did sparklers as a kid, you can draw different patterns uh, in space. And if you just want to do something, um, you know, some unique operation, you can just do this little subtle movement. And they love that because it doesn't draw attention to them. It was the most shocking um, thing that we heard when we said, well, why don't you just use Siri, you know, use your voice recognition. And multiple patients have told us, A, it draws attention to themselves. They don't like doing, using it. Uh, and also when it's noisy in public or in a room or in a restaurant, it doesn't work. Um, it's frustrating. And they love this because it's just natural, either natural movement they already do, or they can do some little subtle thing. They can do a little circle. It, they, they absolutely love it. Um, it, just, it just works. Okay, so that's... Um, let me stop right there. A bunch of uh, someone said this. This is cool. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there's uh, what role do you play in developing this technology? Uh, what all do you do in a day? <laughs> okay, good question. Um, so, so yeah, I have to wear a few hats. Um, you know, with my background, uh, and it really is just the way I've always been. I I, I love to be uh, deep into the data and in the lab and working with participants as much as I can. I don't. I'm not always. Now, uh, in the lab, but but I try to do that as much as possible. You always learn something or you have good ideas, right? So that's super important. Never lose hold of that if, if that's what gets you excited. And and so um, so I do a lot of that. I obviously have to you know help uh, you know guide these these big projects. They're complex, a lot of moving parts. We have a lot of collaborators, so building relationships. I do a lot of that. Um, and uh, and I also I still go deep into the data, and I even still develop algorithms and, and new techniques. Of, uh, we've been doing deep learning lately and, and we've really made some great progress there. So it's kind of a mix of a lot of things. Um, is this technology more difficult for lower extremities? Good, great question. Uh, it, 
it is because now you're talking about balance and however this is all kind of like feedback control right and that's part of why i love this is it's control theory you we walk when we walk we use pressure information from the bottoms of our feet uh and even as we just literally lean obviously we have our sense of balance um in, in the inner ear and whatnot but but it's the pressure on the bottoms of our feet that also uh, are key it's super important when we walk um, if your feet are numb, you, you'll notice it becomes difficult as you navigate different terrain or go upstairs and whatnot. You got to have that feedback. Uh, you have feedback, obviously, from your hips and all throughout your legs, uh, proprioception again, uh, and then in tension. But what we found is that we can, in fact, we just did another test the other day. Uh, we stimulate uh, the, the quads, for example, with the focal stem, and we get a really strong contraction, very uh, targeted. Uh, but we have to learn all those patterns. Walking is definitely is, is very tricky because of that, that feedback. Um, and so, but we have a lot of ideas and we have some people um, that are actually international participants that want to get involved and in, in there's some that are traveling in. Okay, um, let me jump to the next thing. Uh, do, 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 do. Okay, study recruitment. I would love to get help actually from all of you. Uh, if you meet uh, or come across any patients um, in your in your work and all the important things that you guys are doing day in day out uh, but if you can keep an eye out uh, for any potential candidates uh, we have our studies on clinicaltrials.org you can search uh, you can put my name or rich mamdeo he's my um, clinical manager you can put in um, neural bypass i think is still i think we use that uh, and yeah right here so it's you can search that phrase i think that gets you narrowed down uh, but we have two studies, the one with, uh, with the implant. We also have some uh, focused on uh, the neuromuscular stem. We now have a uh, approval uh, on our FDA study that we're uh, FDA uh, cleared study uh, that involves stimulating the spinal cord too. So we put a chip in the brain uh, and we decode their, their intentions to move their hand and do all sorts of things with their fingers. But then we stimulate the spinal cord uh, just below the injury at the same time. So we modulate that. So it's paired stem. Um, this, we have evidence uh, now, and there's, uh, we're collaborating with some groups on this, some of the leaders in, in this area as well uh, that, that are at different places. But we now think this together will make a huge impact on plasticity and possibly restoring uh, and maybe even promoting uh, recovery of movement. So that at some point, you know, a few months down the road, you could turn off everything and perhaps even promote natural uh, recovery. It's super exciting, and that's um, our latest addition to the study. Um, we are now recruiting, though, so please keep your eye out. These are C5, C5 C6, uh, basically that they don't have hand, um, you know, functional hand movement. They can have, again, they can have biceps. They can move their shoulders. In fact, we, we like that um, but because we really focus on the hands, and that's C5 is a very common, in fact, the most common uh, cervical, you know, uh, level of injury for uh, for quadriplegics uh, or tetraplegics. Okay, and um, please, uh, and also stroke patients, uh, we now are adding uh, you know, that to uh, another study that involves the, uh, the wireless patch and the glide path technology. Um, we, uh, I guess in conclusion, we have you know, this uni and bi-directional neural bypass. Um, I think you hopefully got a sense of that. Uh, we're really accelerating the development uh, on that and also a non-invasive version that can do at least some basic things uh, and hopefully make a really nice impact on quality of life. Uh, neuro touch is where we're adding the sense of touch uh, and we have some wonderful uh, data on that now and that's all approved as well. We're recruiting for that. Um, and um, and we've, have, we've formed a, uh, a, a company that is uh, going to be focused on the non-invasive wearables, and uh, it's called uh, Nuvotion. Uh, and the reason that's so important is so I, sp I spent about 19 or 18 or 19 of my early years in uh, not only trying to do uh, new technologies and working in the lab, uh, but also to take some of our uh, work to the market Place, to the medical device market. And we did that um, on a number of occasions and quite a few occasions uh, for things that were working and promising. Uh, and that is a tough battle, right? Getting through the valley of death and getting things out of the market. But what people don't sometimes realize is that there's exciting challenges even, even trying to productize or commercialize. Um, and it's super 
challenging to get things to work reliably in, in people, right? If people take things and they go and use it in their daily lives, uh, or you're in the operating room, or you're in the clinical environment, uh, and definitely in the home environment, all sorts of, you know, variables come into play. And so um, a lot of exciting challenges, and we're, we're working to accelerate it. And the other reason that, that we formed the company is because, um, for that piece, is because uh, we've had many patients ask us, you know, could, could I, you know, could I get, you know, a version of this? Uh, could I take this home? You know, they want to, they want to take it home at the end of, after their sessions. And, um, and for years, we've had to say, oh, I'm sorry, you know, we, you know, we're, we're still in the research phase, uh, but now we can say, you know what, we are, we are working on that. And uh, we hope to, in the next uh, couple of years, be able to, um, you know, to, to provide some uh, first products. And uh, anyway, so that's kind of the full story and a bunch of questions are, are popping up. Um, and let me just stop there and let, uh, so there's still time for some discussion. <clears throat> Yeah, a lot of, should I, Josh, should I just go through questions this way through the text or how do you want to? Yeah, I would just pull out a few from the chat that you think are important to answer in the next few minutes. Okay, great. Yeah, it looks like we have just a few left. Um, let's see, uh, post years, uh, would this technology help patients that are several years post trauma? Yes, absolutely. We've had cases of four years, five years, and even seven, up to seven years uh, post uh, injury or post stroke. Um, we... As far as, and in the last piece where we're adding spinal cord stem, I mean, it would be obviously better to start that sooner, but we've had cases where there's still multiple years, you know, uh, past or post injury. Uh, psychological screening has to be, does it have to be done? Yeah, it, only in the sense that they have to be able to, you know, understand instructions. Uh, they're not overly complicated, but, you know, you want them to be uh, you know, able to understand instructions and, um, and that they have a good you know, they, they should have a good support system around them because they're coming in, they're dedicated to come in, you know, a couple few hours uh, at a time. And, and often we like them to come in, uh, you know, a few times a week. And so, you know, it takes, uh, it takes a lot of dedication um, and just concentration, be able to concentrate for, for a couple hours, a few hours. Um, what's the most amount of fine motor control you've ever seen from one of these patients? Ah, using this. Yeah, holding a pen or writing. Yeah, we have... The so Guitar Hero individual finger control uh, was one of the was one of the most advanced things you can typing requires uh, your lumbricals which we can stimulate and do but we haven't tried that yet and so you have to be able to kind of move uh, in another dimension um, so typing we have not reached but but kind of hitting buttons and moving individual fingers we've done uh, picking up small objects we've done we've done pinch grasp. Uh, Patients have been able to switch between, you know, a cylindrical and a pinch grasp and go back and forth and even uh, switch to some rhythmic. The, the, the question is, what, what does drumming your fingers, you know, help you do? Well, not, not much, but, um, yeah, but, what, uh, but rhythmic actually is important for like scratching. So we've done rhythmic wrist movements and you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't think that would be important, but someone goes to scratch and they're paralyzed, um, being able to, to actually uh, oscillate their wrist is, is important. Uh, or can be important, and um, you know these 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 are just basic basic things. Um, uh, but we've made some progress on that. Um, what else? Uh, let's see. So we got a lot of thank you so much for the a bunch of really nice um, comments, and then uh, let me look for a question. Wow, a lot of a lot of great comments. Uh, window of time for this tech. Okay, good. Yeah, window of time for the technology. We kind of touched on. On that now, uh, the non-invasive version uh, that can recognize movements and stimulate. I've already been having uh, conversations with the FDA. Uh, hopefully, in the next uh, you know year or two, uh, we'll start to uh, you know to bring that out and transition that. Um, could patients have uh, who've had limited mobility most of their lives benefit? It depends on if they have if they respond to uh, muscle stimulation. If they're still you know there's going to be atrophy in muscles in all these cases. Uh, but if they still, uh, if they're at a point where they can respond uh, and get some movement, we can actually build that muscle back up. We've seen that. Um, and so there's, yeah, a lot of possibilities. Um, and uh, using this technology, is there a possibility or potential to develop a functional map of the brain, uh, maybe even the spinal cord? There's definitely a lack of robust spinal cord maps. Okay, great comment. Great question. Um, there is a, absolutely a possibility. We are, uh, we are getting 
probably some of the best maps in the brain, uh, both in the motor and sensory, because we literally have implants and now we have um, uh, acute sensory or acute stem uh, mapping, uh, but we have you know, chronic uh, recording and then we're approved for chronic uh, stimulation too. And we're, yeah, we're getting great maps of building the brain. And spinal cord is a little more challenging because uh, you can't, you, not much has been done in terms of of chronic implants in humans. There's been chronic in animals, there's been acute in human, but it's, you know, you're, you're, it's a tougher problem, you know, to get, uh, you know, the electrodes in intimate contact. There are epidural electrodes where some recordings have been done um, in not super high resolution, but, uh, but some good information. And then we're stimulating uh, also transcutaneously, but that's not going to be uh, uh, a high resolution map, but we are getting some basic maps. Um, there. Okay, and I think, let me scroll down. We're going to have to uh, stop here, I think. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, the whole bunch of more questions, but we'll, uh, maybe I uh, can come out there at some point. I need to come uh, anyway. And uh, this is, and thanks so much again for asking me to do this. And yep. Thank we, you uh, so much for good. joining us. Thank you so much for joining us today. Just as a reminder to everybody, the last episode of this season of By the Book is tonight, so make sure to check that out if you're interested. But thank you, Chad, for joining us. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and somebody was asking, um, a couple of folks asking for my email. We, I don't mind if you want uh, yeah. to send thank it out. It's, it's just cbouton at northwell.edu. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Take care. Good luck with all of your uh, endeavors. And I know your lives have been hard, but thank you for everything you guys do. Really incredible. Thank you.